prior to this year, porpoising is an effect that we haven't seen in F1 for a very long time. So this raises the question of what changed in the 2022 Formula 1 rules to cause porpoising to resurface. In this video, we'll have a look at the changes in the aerodynamic and mechanical rules for 2022, as well as how some of the testing rules are laid out and see why porpoising has now become a thing. For those of you that are new to my channel, I was an aerodynamicist for Mercedes for the 2018, 19 and 20 Formula 1 seasons and I now work as an aerodynamics consultant designing race car aerodynamics packages for cars in all different classes all around the world. Now the biggest goal in the 2022 rule set was to try and improve the overtaking action on track and the main way that it achieved this was by some very significant aerodynamic changes. In addition to that, more standardized parts were brought in and the complexity of the mechanical systems and the suspension systems was limited in an attempt to reduce costs and fall in line with an overall budget cap that was being introduced for the sport. However, any large set of rules changes can have unintended consequences. And to start with, let's talk about the aerodynamics changes and what they did. The 2022 regulations are another iteration on a set of earlier regs changes that were aiming to improve overtaking. In 2017, the cars were given significantly more freedom in terms of what they could do aerodynamically from a size and complexity perspective that enabled them to make a lot more downforce. This caused problems with overtaking. And in 2019, a move was made to simplify the front wings. What we have here is the 2018 style wings with their, their front cascades uh, and their significantly outwashing end plates and cones. Whereas on this side, you can see the far simplified version of the 2019 wings. The 2019 cars also had different rules around the barge boards, where the 2018 cars, you could build them up with very tall barge boards along here. The 2019 cars had lower barge boards along there. Now, the intent of these rules changes was to reduce the outwashing of the tire wake. All these devices could be used to help control and outwash the front tire wake, and outwashing that front tire wake more is bad for the car following, because it has a wider wake to follow in. In 2021, the rules were changed again, this time to reduce the overall level of downforce because the larger regulations change was pushed back by COVID. So what they did was they cut the edge of the floor along here. You can see that cut there. And they also reduced and defeatured all the little detailing that we could put in the floor back here, like slots and things like that. They also made a change to the maximum winglet length coming out of the cake tin here and they reduced the size of the diffuser strakes. All of these changes were to reduce the overall level of downforce, which they largely achieved. Then along came the 2022 regulations, which were a much larger overhaul of the aerodynamic design. In fact, the largest overhaul in aerodynamic technical regulations that the sport has ever seen. The 22 regs kept a lot of the simplified front wing features, although they simplified it even further, removing the foot plates at the bottom of the wing, limiting more the curvature and vortex generating features, and removing the central Y250 section, or the neutral section, from the older designs. They also went through and adjusted the front cake tin, so you now had a spec front cake tin that was the same for all teams, so all this part is all spec, whereas before you could do it all yourself and design all the features yourself. This also meant that in conjunction with wheel covers on the outside, you could no longer flow through the air that you could on the older cars. Because there's now a big plate on the outside, the air flow through there had to go in and back out on the inside. And this, again, stops the outwash of the mid wake and the outer wake of the front wheel. Moving further back, the barge board area as we know it was completely eliminated and replaced with these smaller strakes down here at the front of the floor that were reduced in size, reduced in complexity, and therefore their overall outwashing potential was also reduced as we couldn't have such aggressive departure angles here, the rules didn't allow it. So again, stopping this wake from coming out the side as much as it was on this side. All of this is trying to keep the wheel wakes at the front tighter, which means a narrower wake as we travel further downstream. Going back further along and looking at this overlay of the floor, you can see that we more or less followed that trim of the floor edge along here in terms of what was legally allowed that was very similar from the previous year's car. Although the teams aren't allowed to go anywhere near as tight to the tire at the rear of the floor. In the older rules, they could come up right to the back of it along here. Moving back to the diffuser, you'll see that a lot of the complexity of the rear end and diffuser was completely removed by the new rules. All this detailing along here, all the tire strakes and things like that going on there, 
You can see they're completely gone here. The rules do of course permit cutouts and things like that in the new rules, but no sort of winglets or any of that sort of stuff. You have geometrically a far simpler and more regulated diffuser sidewall along here. You can't have any sort of flare to the magnitude that we had on the older style sidewalls. And you can see that we don't have this highly complex winglet system anymore, replaced by just having an extra beam wing on the back. The diffuser itself is much narrower on the new design than the old design. You can see how much narrower it is. It's also much taller. It's far more of an upwashing motion than an outwashing motion. You'll also see that along the cake tin, we have a dramatically simplified uh, rear cake tin compared to the older designs where the cake tins were getting quite complex because the teams had free reign over whatever they wanted to do with all the little cake tin winglets along there. On the newer cars, the cake tin deflector is actually a spec part. All teams can change on that particular component is the end plate trim along the bottom and an angle alignment of the deflector. The teams can do more stuff up top, but they can't change down the bottom. Now, what do all these rear end changes do together? Well, we can see that we've changed the focus of the diffuser massively from an outwashing device to an upwashing device. Previously, we had a lot of outwash from the winglets. We had a lot of outwash from the flare, a lot of lower weight control on the wheel wake. We were pushing all that wake out. We also had a lot of upwash too uh, from our custom deflectors here and our winglet it would help push all this wheel wake out. On the newer style car, we're being forced to draw this in more. The deflector naturally draws this in, and so the rear wheel wake is gonna creep in more. We've got an upwashing central portion through both the beam wing and the higher top of the diffuser, and we've also got the top end plate section that was there before on the rear wing missing, so we have a rolled over end tip, which is presumably gonna to lead to a lower rear wing main vortex location. All of these are going to result in the wake being drawn in more. Now, when you have the front wake being drawn in more, compared to going out and the rear wake being drawn in more, the net result is, is that the car should have a narrower rear wake instead of a much wider rear wake on the older cars. And this is more or less the intent of what the regulations have done. Now, all these changes to bring the wake in tighter are of course not without consequence because the objective that teams have always been trying to do is kick those wakes out because if you kick the front wake out, you can get cleaner air where you want it along here. And if you kick the rear wake out, you get more expansion from the rear diffuser and therefore you get more diffuser performance and suction along the entire floor. So all these rule changes are going to result in less downforce and less downforce means a slower car. Obviously they want F1s to still be a very fast car class. So they have to come up with other ways of giving them back performance. And it appears that the primary method that's being used to do that is to allow the underbody to be far more sculpted. But it's not quite as simple as that, and let me explain. For quite some time now, the rules have mandated uh, essentially a counter to the cars having skirts, and that's in the form of what's known as the reference and the step plane. On older style cars like this, you'll see that the lower surface of the floor, right down at the bottom, along this canoe portion here, is lower by 50 millimeters than this secondary surface along here. So there's the reference and the step planes. Now having this step plane like this means that you have a high ride height or a high ground clearance all the way to the edge of the floor. On the 22 cars, they've actually abolished that step plane. If you have a look at where the reference plane is in the center uh, and where the outside edge is, it's allowed to go down to the same height. It has to go a little bit higher at the front, but through the mid and rear portion of the floor, it can stay exactly the same height as the center of the floor. This means that you can get your floor edges really, really close to the ground. Now, when these floor edges are so close to the ground, they obviously have a strong resistance to flow that's being sucked in sideways by the tunnel. So obviously we have our diffuser kick going on there. Our car's naturally gonna suck in air through here. If we can get this big flat section quite close to the ground, we can resist air moving in and we can get a lot of suction at a really, really low ride height. You couldn't do that on the old floor designs because the rules stopped you from physically getting there. Now this means that we have potential to extract more downforce from underneath for a given geometry, which we need to do because we've lost it by restricting everything else. But it also means that that downforce is all going to be sitting right at the bottom end of the ride height range. The car's gonna perform well when the ride height is low. But there's another factor that I wanna raise that doesn't really get much discussion and I think is actually a large reason as to why these cars have to run so low. 
Like I mentioned before, on the older cars we had a lot of diffuser edge detailing and winglets to control the lower tyre wake. This was how cars were able to run such high amounts of rake and still be very successful. In addition to all this detailing, if you look around the front, there was more control in terms of what you could do directly in front of the tire, in terms of both strakes and in terms of floor positioning. So just overall, there was a lot more scope to control the tire wake. With the 22 cars, that is no longer there as a scope. You have no ability to make veins just in front of the tire. You can do some degree of ramps and kicks, but it's quite limited by the radius rules and you have no option to get a huge amount of outwash off the sidewall and down along the tire. And then you can't pair that very well with a particular lower deflector geometry because the lower deflector is a spec part. Combine that with the fact that the sidewall is mandated to be almost dead vertical and we have very limited means to control the lower tire wake. So in this case, what's the best way to stop all this nasty tire wake coming in and getting sucked into the diffuser? Well, you just physically barrier it to the floor with the sidewall. And to do that, you have to run as low a ride height as possible in the rear. Now, because you don't have the same sort of nice relationships between the deflector and the sidewall that you'd have on the old car, it would mean that going up and down in ride height probably doesn't lead to any significant change in downforce as a result of the interaction between the two. So the biggest benefit you're gonna get is by dropping that rear sidewall right close to the ground. And straight away you can see why these new cars would have to run lower to the ground on the rear than the older cars in order to get peak performance. And this is why we don't see cars running rake like they used to because we don't have these control mechanisms anymore. And it's this very nature of running the rear of the car very low to the ground that's causing this rear end of porpoising because all the nasty interactions I talked about in my previous porpoising video are all triggered by running very close to the ground and having significant loss and transient effects when you're running in this region. Running low to the ground also means you need to run a much stiffer springing setup, particularly in heave, and so that is going to contribute to the problem by pushing the natural frequencies of the suspension up and causing a whole bunch of other problems. So those are the primary aerodynamic reasons, but let's talk about some of the mechanical reasons. In one of my previous videos, I discussed the concept of heave springs on a race car. So basically using a separate spring to control the heave motion as opposed to the roll motion on a car. Now, a lot of teams were previously running heave springs, but they weren't heave springs in the conventional sense that we're thinking here. A lot of teams were running either hydraulic or hydropneumatic heave springs. They still did fundamentally the same thing, but they had much better control of the ride height than a conventional setup. For 2022, these were outlawed in the interest of cost and simplicity, and that undoubtedly would have had an impact in terms of the team's abilities to control their ride height on the car. The other device that was notably banned was the inerter. Now, to describe what an inerter is, we have to go a little bit back to the fundamentals. Let's imagine that we have a graph here, and this graph is going to be position on our suspension system versus time. So time along here, position this way. Let's say our position of our suspension system reacts to an impulse like that and then flattens off. Our springs on the car deliver a force based on positions. So if we look at our spring force, our springs will be delivering a force at a certain level and then they would increase the level and continue there. Our dampers on the car deliver a force proportional to the velocity. So they would deliver no force at all and then the velocity is increased, the damper will go and it will deliver a significant force there that will then stop once the velocity turns off. So that's our spring and damper system. But of course, there's another component we can tune, which is the acceleration. In this case, our acceleration is infinite, but imagine we had something that we could go along and it would go along and it would make a force that responds to the acceleration there and it goes and responds to the acceleration there. So each one of these components is essentially a derivative of this initial position function. Now, this third component in black is what an inerter is. It basically is a tunable resistance in your suspension system to accelerations. And if you have this tunable inerter, any very high acceleration vertical movements through the suspension can be tuned out. Things like curbs, any sort of harsh bumps like that. And also conceivably, it can be used to help with porpoising. Now, notably, 
the inerta is absent this year. And while I don't think that having inerters would have completely solved having porpoising, I think they definitely would have helped because any high energy oscillations you could help tune out with the help of an inerter. So now what we have is a car that we want to run at a really low ride height and we now have reduced mechanisms to control any oscillations that may come from running the car low and stiff and having potential porpoising. So you can see that we're in a bit of a nightmare scenario where we're in an aerodynamically uh, easy to porpoise range, but also uh, with limited control mechanisms. And another factor to add in on this is the fact that we shifted to a larger diameter wheel this year with a different tire on it. Now the teams wouldn't have as much data on these tires as the old tires, but it's safe to say that there's going to be a tire sidewall stiffness difference. And even if you had a 100% stiff suspension on the car, there is still a spring rate and a small damping rate to the tire sidewall. So this is just another factor at play. There is still one more factor in this though, which is how teams are able to detect and correct porpoising. And that comes down to wind tunnel testing. And there's actually a bit in the regulations that stops them effectively doing porpoising tests in the wind tunnel. Now, when it comes to testing in the wind tunnel, teams are regulated to testing 60% scale models on rolling road setups. Now, they're allowed to control the attitude of this model in terms of they can change the ride height, steer, etc., etc., etc. But there's actually some subtleties and limits here. The first one is a physical limit. You can't scrape the model into the belt on your tunnel too much because if you do that, you're going to seriously damage the tunnel belt. And that's going to hurt your repeatability. It's going to cost a lot of money. It's not a good idea. You don't want to be scraping your model into the belt all the time. So immediately, your very low range of ride heights where your porpoising is most an issue are going to be hard to look at. But let's say you're in a regime where your car is porpoising at a higher ride height than hitting the belt. Now, this isn't uncommon. There's plenty of cars doing this. If you look at the Ferrari, it's a prime example. So let's say you just want to move the model up and down in the wind tunnel. Your first problem is you're going to have to jerk around that model super fast. And then it's going to be very hard to get accurate readings from your sensors on both your load cells and your aerodynamic sensors on the models. So that's going to be tricky. But let's say you can sort all that. Even if you were able to technically achieve it, the rules actually prevent you from moving the model as fast as porpoising is. There's a little note in the regs that says you can't move the ride heights at faster than 0.033 meters per second on a full size F1 car. And this is actually quite slow. A little infographic from F1 TV suggested that the average porpoising speed on the cars at the start of the year was around about five Hertz. That means that its frequency of oscillation was about five cycles per second. Now using a simple sinusoidal motion calculator online, and an input of 33 millimeters per second for my speed and an oscillation distance that I'm going to assume they're oscillating through about 20 millimeters of rear ride height. That means that the best frequency that we could get is half a Hertz. So we're off by almost a factor of 10 here in terms of how fast we can actually move the tunnel model. So any sort of transient effects that are being induced and causing porpoising or causing instability in the diffuser may just not show up at all at this oscillation speed. This is the thing, as I spoke about in the previous video, you have transient effects and aerodynamic instabilities like hysteresis that can change depending on the speed you're moving and the direction you're moving. And if you move the model very slowly, these effects may just never show up. And this is likely why none of the teams saw the porpoising coming from their tunnel data. So you can see how the 2022 regulations cause porpoising and why it's made it so hard for the teams to detect and correct it. Well, that's all for this video. Thanks for watching. If you liked it, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. Leave a comment below on what videos you'd like to see next from me and hopefully I'll see you next time.